Good morning and welcome to today's briefing. I'm Dr June Rain and I'm the Chief Executive of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, the UK's independent regulator for medicines, medical devices and vaccines. May I first introduce the colleagues who are with me this morning. On my left, Professor Sir Munir Per Mohammed, who is Professor of Medicine at Liverpool University and Chair of the Commission on Human Medicine's Expert Working Group on COVID-19 Vaccines. Sir Munir will be providing more detail shortly on his work. And on my right, may I introduce Professor Wei Shen Lim, who is Professor of Respiratory Medicine at Nottingham University and Chair of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation Subgroup, which has been preparing advice on COVID-19 vaccines. The Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, the Licensing Authority, has now, on the basis of the advice of its scientific body, the Commission on Human Medicines, approved the COVID-19 vaccine developed by AstraZeneca and Oxford University here in the UK, together with the conditions for its supply and use. This vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine AstraZeneca, has been approved for use in people aged 18 years and older with two standard doses, four to 12 weeks apart. As I've said before, and I will say again today, the safety of the public always comes first. The MHRA's approval has been reached following a thorough and scientifically rigorous review of all the evidence of safety, of quality, and of effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccine, AstraZeneca. We all know that we are facing one of the biggest threats to health, not only of the UK public, but everyone around the world. And as the UK regulator, we take this very seriously indeed. These are difficult times for so many of us, but vaccines such as this one will have the potential to save many lives and will see us come through. Having an effective vaccine is the best way to protect us and may save tens of thousands of lives. Let me briefly remind how we have got to this point. The MHRA has worked in a process known as a rolling review, and a rolling review can be used to complete the assessment of a promising new medicine or a vaccine in the shortest time possible. During a public health emergency, such as this one. Our teams of scientists and clinicians have very carefully and methodically and rigorously reviewed all the data on safety, on effectiveness and on quality as soon as they have become available and have done so round the clock looking at all the tests and trials, even over holiday periods. No corners whatsoever have been cut. We have one or two slides to help illustrate this point. And the first slide will show, when it comes up, how the preparatory work for our surveillance system started back in June, six months ago fully, and for batch testing of the vaccine at our National Institute for Biological Standards and Control back in July. Our teams of clinicians and scientists then undertook a rigorous assessment of all the available data on safety, on quality and on effectiveness as soon as they became available in packages or tranches. Clinical trials from the 24th of September, manufacturing and quality controls from that date, the laboratory preclinical studies from the 30th of September, product sampling and testing of the final vaccine from the 1st of December. And most recently, our expert clinicians and scientists have reviewed and agreed the overall benefit risk and the prescribing information which is being provided to all healthcare professionals and for everyone about having the vaccine so everyone can be very clear and confident and understand what's involved to help those informed decisions together with your healthcare professional. Our National Institute for Biological Standards and Control has been undertaking the independent laboratory testing so that we can make sure that every single batch 
meets the same standards of safety and quality. And the first batch of COVID-19 vaccine, AstraZeneca, was released last night following yesterday's vaccine approval. And another safety step is taken following our thorough review of the data. We sought advice from the Commission on Human Medicines, the independent scientific advisory body. So at this point, I'll pass over to Professor Sir Munir Per Mohammed, who will explain the critical role its independent members have played in robustly assessing all the data. Munir. Th thank you very much, June. So I chaired the CHM's expert working group for the COVID-19 vaccine AstraZeneca. It's also important to note that there was independent scrutiny from the Commission on Human Medicine itself. And I'd first of all like to thank members of both committees for the work they put in uh, to get us to this point. The expert working group I chaired was made up of independent leading scientific members specializing in many different areas which are important for vaccine development. For example, in virology, the study of viruses, immunology, study of the immune system, epidemiology, study of patterns of disease, toxicology and clinical pharmacology, the study of medicines and vaccines and their effects uh, in the human body. The group also included lay membership. They were instrumental uh, too in many of these assessments. They freely gave their views and opinions and certainly played a crucial role uh, in the assessment and decision-making process of the committee. The remit of the committee was really to look at the data and evidence in relation to the effectiveness, safety and quality uh, of the vaccine and in particular to weigh the benefits against the risks uh, of any vaccine. We looked at all the available data. We had all access to all the raw data as well as the assessment reports from the MHRA and we answered questions from the MHRA. As Dr. Rain has said, this was a rolling review, um, which meant that we were looking at data as it was coming in. When we uh, felt the data was not adequate, we went back to the company to ask for more data. We also asked for more analysis. We had many hours of committee work on this, um, including uh, over the holiday period recently, to come to the decision we came to uh, yesterday evening. I want to take you through some of our deliberations with the next slide, please. And we focused on uh, four particular areas, and I'll go through them uh, in turn. The first relates to the dose. What we are uh, approving uh, is that two standard doses should be given. They should be given uh, at an interval of between four to 12 weeks, i.e that there should be an interval of four to 12 weeks between the first and second dose. We also looked at the half-dose regimen, which has been publicized quite widely, but we felt that the results were not borne out by the full analysis. We've come to the decision of an interval of between four to 12 weeks based on the data that was presented to us. Because of the design of the trial, some people got second doses at different time intervals. This allowed an analysis of the effectiveness of vaccine if you were to be able to delay between four to 12 weeks. This showed that the effectiveness was high, up to 80%, when there was a three-month interval between first and second doses, which is the reason for our, our recommendation. We looked at data in all age groups, but particularly in the elderly, while there was a small number of people aged over 65 in the clinical trials, uh, the CHM concluded the vaccine can be given to this age group. We know the further results from US trials plus the UK trial will be available in January 2021 or in February 2021 and will help build our existing knowledge relating to the effectiveness and safety of the vaccine in this age group. It is important to note that the vaccine does not protect uh, immediately. Uh, you have to wait until day 22 before you get partial immunity after the first dose. And so it is really important that people continue to follow all the government guidelines uh, for your area of the country. We obviously looked at the safety as well. 
and the Commission on Human Medicines concluded that the safety profile of this vaccine is broadly similar to other vaccines. We will get uh, side effects which may be uh, in your arm or some, some uh, pain where the vaccine injection was, but that usually lasts for a very short time, less than a day or so. There is limited data on the use of this vaccine in pregnant or breastfeeding women. Women should discuss the benefits and risks of having the vaccine with the healthcare professional based on their own individual circumstances and reach a decision together. We also were uh, interested in knowing whether there was any particular issues with allergy uh, in relation to the vaccine. Uh, we've come to the recommendation people with a known history of reacting to any specific ingredients of the vaccine should not have it. But people with allergies to other medicines or food can have the vaccine. People should also talk to the healthcare professionals if they have ever had a severe allergic reaction after any other vaccine. The other aspect that we looked at was quality. Unlike the Pfizer vaccine, this does not need ultra low temperature storage. It can be stored at between two to eight degrees centigrade for at least six months. This is the typical temperature of a domestic refrigerator. This will make deployment of the vaccine much easier and much faster. Clearly, this is a new vaccine. And so the Commission was very keen to be able to support the MHRA proposals for a proactive safety monitoring strategy. This comprises the yellow card scheme, which anybody can report to, um, and there's a special active monitoring program, which some people who receive the vaccine which will, be, will be invited to join. Finally, the committee considered that no specific precautions were required on administration of this vaccine in people who've already had COVID-19. No testing is required before receiving the vaccine. Thank you, June. Thank you, Munir. Another major aspect of our work at the MHRA is keeping our approvals up to date as new evidence emerges. And I would like to take a moment now to briefly update on the latest advice on the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, which we approved in early December. So the next slide, please, summarises the updated guidance on the use of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, particularly in pregnancy and women who are breastfeeding, in people with allergies, and also on the dose interval. Taking first pregnancy and women who are breastfeeding, our advice to date has been that given that an in initial lack of evidence on a precautionary basis, use of the vaccine wasn't recommended in pregnancy and women with breastfeeding should not be given the vaccine. But now that we have reviewed further data that has become available, the Commission on Human Medicines has advised that the vaccine can be considered for use in pregnancy when the potential benefits outweigh the risks following an individual discussion with every woman. And as the COVID-19 vaccine AstraZeneca is the same, women should always be discussing benefits and risks of having the vaccine with their health professional reaching a decision together based on individual circumstances. And women who are breastfeeding can now also be given the vaccine subject to that individual discussion. Turning to people with allergies, we previously issued advice that people with a range of allergies to food, to vaccines, to other medicines should not be given the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. But there is now growing evidence in a much wider pool of people who've had the vaccine, at least 800,000 in the UK, probably a million and a half in the USA, which has raised no additional concerns and gives us further assurance that the risk of anaphylaxis can be managed through standard clinical guidance and an observation period following vaccination of at least 15 minutes. And so the Commission on Human Medicines has now advised that anyone with allergy to food or other medicinal vaccine can have the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine 
Of course, anyone with a history of allergic reaction to this vaccine or its ingredients should not. Finally, the dose interval. The Commission on Human Medicines, on further review of the data, has recommended that the second dose is at least 21 days after the first. So this allows for a potentially longer interval compared with the previous advice that was 21 days. And the conditions for use of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine stress that this is in accordance with national guidance. So those are the updates on the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. They mean that even more people are now eligible for vaccination. I'll now invite Professor Wei Shen Lim to update us on the latest advice on how the vaccines will be used. Wei Shen. Thank you, June. The Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation is an independent scientific group that advises the Secretary of State regarding issues related to vaccination. The JCVI, for short, uh, has been reviewing data from both vaccines, both the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine. And we're pleased to find that both vaccines are acceptably safe and effective for the use of protecting adults from COVID-19, including from protecting adults from severe disease. Could I have the first slide, please? We note that there have been no head-to-head -head trials that compare the two different vaccines. The clinical trials that have been conducted so far have been trials where one vaccine has been compared against a placebo or a control uh, vaccine. Those trials established the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines. However, the trials uh, are not the same in terms of how they've been conducted, uh, in terms of where they've been conducted, in relation to the kinds of people who've participated in the trials and precise study outcomes. Therefore, it's not possible to compare uh, the results from the different trials relating to the two different vaccines. The committee's advice is that for individuals eligible for vaccination in the phase one program in the UK, that both vaccines may be used with no preference for one vaccine above the other. Can I have the next slide, please? It will be noted, however, that the two vaccines differ in terms of their storage and handling requirements. This has already been alluded to earlier. For instance, for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, a very cold storage is required up to minus 70 degrees, whilst for the AstraZeneca vaccine, that needs to be stored at two to eight degrees. These logistical considerations are important. To facilitate rapid deployment of the vaccine within a mass vaccination program and to avoid substantial vaccine wastage, it may be that in certain settings, one vaccine is offered in preference over another. Get the next slide, please. Finally, I just want to touch on the dosing interval. Both vaccines have been approved for a two-dose schedule. What is impressive about the vaccine studies is that after the first dose, uh, individuals acquire a high level of protection shortly after the dose. Currently in the UK, we know that COVID infection rates are very, very high. The immediate urgency is for rapid and high levels of vaccine uptake. JCVI therefore recommends that delivery of the first dose of COVID-19 vaccine should be prioritized for both the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine. This will allow the greatest number of eligible people to receive vaccine in the shortest time possible, and that will protect the greatest number of lives. The second vaccine dose is still important because it may impact on the duration of protection we recommend that the second dose is given up to 12 weeks after the first dose. With today's announcement, uh, both from the MHRA on the approval of the AstraZeneca vaccine and the advice from JCVI regarding how to use these vaccines, 
we can expect that the amount of vaccine available for use in the UK will very substantially increase very, very soon. This increase in the vaccine supply will in turn allow a much higher rate of vaccine deployment across the UK to all parts of the country. And this is good news for all of us at a very critical time in this pandemic. I'd like to end therefore by thanking all the people who have contributed to this national response and are still contributing. These include trial participants, volunteers, scientists, researchers, health professionals, and many more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wei Shen. We now have questions from the media, and I would like to turn to our first question, which is from Fergus Walsh of the BBC. Good morning. Morning, thank you very much. Um, can you tell me what level of protection uh, one dose of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine will give three weeks after immunization? And secondly, um, how can you be sure that this vaccine will protect the elderly, um, given that there's very little efficacy data from the trials in older people? Thank you. These are both issues which the Commission on Human Medicines considered very carefully indeed, and so I will ask Sir Muneer to address them. Thank you very much. So uh, with regard to protection after first dose, we, from the data that was uh, given to us, uh, protection starts after day 22, uh, after the first dose. We were able to uh, identify data which suggested that the protection uh, is afforded till at least three months, and hence the reason for the interval dosing of uh, between four to 12 weeks uh, for the second dose. In terms of older people, there was small amount of data available uh, in older people because of the way the trial was designed. Older people have been recruited um, and will be uh, more data in elder people. Older people will be coming online uh, in early 2021 not only from the UK trial, but also from the trial being undertaken in Brazil, but also the trial uh, being undertaken in the United States. From the data that was available, um, there was indication that the, uh, the uh, vaccine was effective uh, in older people uh, as well. Uh, although, obviously, we do need to uh, wait for more data as well to make sure that that initial promise of efficacy in older people is uh, 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 sort of again shown in the in the uh, in the more trials which are coming through. Can you just give a, a, a number on how much protection one dose gives? Sorry. So um, Wei Shen uh, has has been looking at that figure. So maybe Wei Shen might want to comment on that. Yeah. So the data shared with us, and I'm not sure is entirely in the public domain. Uh, calculated the vaccine efficacy between day 22 of dose 1 to uh, the time of dose 2 being given. And uh, the figure is around 70%. But I don't think I uh, should be revealing uh, any more than that at this point in time, if that's uh, uh, all right. I'd like to emphasize two things from that important uh, double question. First is that safety and effectiveness in the elderly are approved. And of course, when we have more data that confirm that initial uh, approval, we will most certainly update. On the point of transparency, we will be putting certain materials in the public domain today, particularly the conditions for use, but we will promptly follow this up with a full public assessment report so that everyone can be confident they have seen the basis for the MHRA's decision. Thank you. Our second question comes from Emily Morgan of ITV. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for this. Um, now that more people will get the first dose quicker, and given the, the huge crisis we're in at the moment, I just wonder whether you will also consider widening the priority list from phase one to perhaps include key workers, uh, specifically teachers, or even um, the, the people who transmit this virus. Thank you. So Wei Shen, is that something you're looking at? Yes, thank you. Uh, there are many key workers and we've received uh, requests from many professional groups uh, who are all concerned and want to have the vaccine, uh, very rightly so. 
the first thing to say is that any teacher who is above 50 years of age will be eligible for vaccination within the phase one program. And any teacher who is under 50 but with underlying health conditions would also be eligible for vaccination within phase one of the program. Phase two of the program will take into account the range of other uh, professions and key workers who would benefit from vaccination and protection, particularly if they can't uh, avoid traveling to work, for instance, or they might be exposed at work. Uh, that decision has not been made yet, so it will come with a phase two uh, advice, but the advice has not been uh, completed yet. May I ask, apologies, may I just ask when you hope to get to phase two? What is the, the time scale on that? Um, as soon as phase one is over, we will get to phase two. So this will depend clearly on the rate of deployment. Uh, and I think one will need to see how vaccine uptake runs over the next uh, few weeks to see what the rate of deployment will be. So it will be under review over the next few weeks. Thank you for highlighting, again, a really important area. Our next question comes from Thomas Moore, Sky News. Over to you. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed. It looks like you may well be scratching around how to use this vaccine. You rejected the suggestion of the scientists developing the vaccine that they use a half dose followed by a full dose. Now you're using unpublished data to justify this untested, uh, unpublished uh, regime of up to 12 weeks between the two doses. How much confidence can people have that this has been a truly robust and transparent process and this vaccine is effective? And secondly, you seem to be balancing the wider social benefit of one dose and giving that to as many people as quickly as possible with the higher individual protection from two doses. I'd like to say straight out and very directly, the public, everyone who's listening can be absolutely confident that the rigor, the scientific uh, uh, rigor of our assessment has been as we would normally do according to guidelines and standards. So those standards have been met and it has been a thoroughly robust process on safety, on quality and on effectiveness. Uh, you've raised a couple of issues within that and I'll ask Sir Muneer to pick up the one, uh, as you've put it, to reject the half dose, which was given extremely careful consideration. Thank you. So we did look at um, all the data in relation to the uh, half dose versus the standard dose. And we also looked at the data in relation to the standard dose, standard dose regimen. Um, what we identified was that the uh, interval uh, in the low dose, standard dose uh, regimen was actually quite long, and that's why we asked for additional analysis on extended uh, interval dosing. And that highlighted that actually the extended interval dosing produced quite good efficacy, very good efficacy, up to 80%, as I said, uh, at an at interval of uh, three months between the first and second dose. Um, the low dose, standard dose regimen uh, although has been quoted to have an efficacy of 90%, this is confounded by the fact that the interval between the first and second dose was quite long, and we feel that the result may be related to that interval rather than the dose I itself. When we publish our assessment report, there'll be a very clear explanation of why the recommendation is for the full dose twice. On the point of transparency and the nature of the comments, Wei Shen, you made about unpublished data, is there any more you would like to add? Uh, I don't think so. It's not uncommon for JCVI to view unpublished data as yet, and usually these data are eventually published. Uh, but at this point in time, they, if they remain unpublished, then clearly we cannot disclose too much information. But there will be a full public assessment report very shortly. Thank you very much it's indeed. Experimental vaccine. And, and you haven't actually given people the data they might need to, to take it. There will be a full publication today of all the conditions followed shortly by the public assessment report. So that will be available for everyone to read and to reflect on. Thank you very much indeed. Let's turn to Jane Merrick. Our next question comes from the eye. 
Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, could I ask firstly, what assessments have been made on whether this um, vaccine reduces transmission as well as illness? And also what assessment has been made on whether it is effective against the new variant of coronavirus? And then secondly, can I just clarify on the issue of people with allergies that you've updated the advice both on the Pfizer vaccine and also on the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine to make clear that it's only people with allergies to the ingredients for both vaccines should not have it and everybody else can feel confident that they can have it. Thank you. Why don't I deal with your last question first? Because that's a very clear answer. Both updates are in place and the only people who are advised not to have either of the vaccines are those with allergies who've had reactions to any of the ingredients. So that's very clear now that we no longer have advice not to use the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine in someone who's had an allergic reaction to food or to another vaccine or drug. So that's very clear and will be published today. So, so Munir, would you like to comment on the reduction of transmission question? Sure. There was some initial data with regard to work which was undertaken with transmission, but we felt that the data was not mature enough to make any recommendations with regard to transmission. Uh, clearly, this is a new vaccine, and further studies will have to be done when it is deployed to ensure uh, to determine whether that it also reduces transmission. So we can't really make any comment on transmission at this stage. Uh, in relation to your question on the new variant, um, we know that the new variant from the published data increases transmissibility. However, there is no data at the moment which suggests that the new variant evades the vaccine in terms of the effectiveness of the vaccine. And studies are ongoing to confirm that. So they will be available in the coming days and weeks. Let's turn now to Kate Pickles from Daily Mail. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, back to the 12 weeks, I'm afraid. I just wondered if you could give us some more. I think we've got a little break in the communication there. You would like some more information about the 12 week gap. Uh, would you like to clarify your question further? Uh, yes, please. It was how exactly the 12 week was reached, uh, whether it was from trials, um, and if so, how many people were given the second dose after 12 weeks, um, whether it was found to be the most optimum time period, or whether within that 12 weeks there's a more optimum time frame that we should be going for. That's very helpful. So, Mania, again. So we looked at the data in terms of how the vaccine was given in the trial, all the data is from the trial, um, so, so that's what we uh, looked at. Um, some people were given the vaccine second dose at four weeks, some people were given the vaccine up to 26 weeks after the first dose. Um, however, we felt that the data was most robust when we looked at between four to 12 weeks, and hence why our recommendation suggests up to a maximum of 12 weeks at the moment. If you look after 12 weeks, there is some data suggesting that there is still some efficacy beyond 12 weeks, but the numbers are too small to be confident of that, um, uh, of, of that time interval. So that is the reason why we suggested that you go between four to 12 weeks. And again, this is something that you'll be able to read more about in our public assessment report. Let's move to Rhys Blakely from The Times. Good morning. Your question, please. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for doing this. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, I've been asked by several readers and a couple of editors uh, this morning already, um, can we mix doses of the, the Pfizer and the Oxford vaccines? Um, can you talk me through the thinking there, whether it's possible now or maybe in the future to, to mix doses of vaccines? And the second question is just about this uh, issue of efficacy. So um, I think you said 70% after one dose but the, the Lancet paper showed 62% efficacy after two full doses. It, it seems a little odd that one dose would give uh, uh, better efficacy than two doses. And, and what does that actually mean for people uh, who may get one dose and then be left for three months before they get their booster shot? How, how should they be sort of thinking about the level of protection they have in that time? 
Thank you. Let's take your first question about mixing doses. And again, I turn to Sir Manir. We're not advising that. Not at this moment. Yes, absolutely right. We're not advising mixing doses of different vaccines because we don't have any data on that. Our advice is that if you have the Pfizer vaccine as a first dose, the second dose should also be the Pfizer vaccine. If you have the AstraZeneca vaccine as a first dose, the second dose should also be the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, there are trials which are being planned uh, where um, different people will receive different, uh, different vaccines at different time points. Um, and that might provide us more data as to whether you can mix the vaccines. Clearly, we'll review this as more data become available. On your second question, Wei Shen, would you like to comment on how we interpret some of the figures that have been given, both in published papers and uh, otherwise, around efficacy of one dose and uh, how we actually align all of this? Wei Shen. Yes, thank you. It's a very important question. Uh, the AstraZeneca trials are uh, not too easy to tease out because there are actually four different trials held in different settings, as you know, with different dose schedules. Uh, some people had the second dose early and some people had the second dose later. Some were uh, half dose, some were standard doses. Uh, the figure I gave earlier is based on the report from the AstraZeneca trial themselves, uh, and they... Uh, suggests an efficacy after the first dose, 21 days after, and up to the time of the second dose of about 70%. And that's based on a subset of patients. So one can't directly compare that with the other efficacy data that's published in the Lancet paper, which you quoted, which is 62%. In terms of um, your discussion about the level of protection there is uh, no advice at the moment that suggests that having been vaccinated, anybody should relax or stop adhering to social distancing measures, other protective measures such as wearing a face mask or hand washing. All those measures are still important at this point in time, even if somebody has received a vaccine. There are many considerations that go into deciding when social distancing measures and personal protective measures should be relaxed. Vaccination is one strand in our defence against the coronavirus. Uh, we need everything that we can do to protect ourselves and at the appropriate time when we can see the vaccine having a true effect on severe disease and people protecting people from dying, then perhaps we can start relaxing social distancing measures. But at the moment, the advice remains that everybody, including those who are vaccinated, should adhere to the latest government guidelines on social distancing measures and other protective measures. So Matt Hancock talked about exiting the pandemic in the spring thanks to the Oxford vaccine coming on stream. Is that realistic, do you think? I think it's right to be very ambitious. Wei Shen. Uh, I... I think it's realistic to be optimistic, uh, trying to put a time to when we can exit and return back to normal is much more difficult, clearly. Thank you. Our last question comes from Rebecca Thomas of the Health Service Journal. Good morning. Good morning, thank you. This is, this is for Professor Lim. Will the JCVI issue new priority guidance to account for the fast spread of the new COVID-19 variant? And will that guidance give greater priority to NHS staff, given the pressure on services? Secondly, will the JCVI offer further guidance about which NHS staff should be prioritised beyond patient safety, um, patient facing, as that is over one million people? Wei Shen. Thank you. Um, I work as a clinician. Over the weekend, I was on my hospital admissions unit and uh, together with the team around me and colleagues, we were treating many people who were coming in sadly with COVID-19. So I'm very well aware of the pressures and strains on the health service, on my colleagues, uh, and the concerns that health professionals have. At the moment, health professionals and frontline workers are already one of the highest priority groups. With the announcements today, we will see a much greater supply in vaccine uh, availability. And that will mean that 
hopefully all NHS frontline workers will very soon be able to be offered a vaccine wherever they are because the constraints will be so much less. And that is the greatest urgency above all. In relation to other NHS workers who are not patient safe facing, then they will also be considered uh, within the groups that are in phase two of the program. So alongside other key workers. And as I mentioned before, uh, that exact decision hasn't been made yet. Sorry, just to clarify, um, there aren't plans to issue new priority guidance. Um, and just to, the, to my second question, um, I was asking about further guidance uh, within the patient-facing group, so further guidance on prioritisation for those staff. Uh, if I can take the second question first. Uh, in our previous statements, which will be updated today, uh, we already describe how one might prioritise within frontline healthcare workers. And so those at greatest personal risk from exposure and severe disease should be prioritised first and prioritised highest within frontline healthcare workers. Um, in relation to your question about whether the priority group should be changed because of um, tier four restrictions or others, uh, is that what you meant? Uh, it was um, to take account for the new variant. The new variant, yes. Uh, at the moment, the new variant, we think, transmits more, but doesn't cause more severe disease. And importantly, there's no suggestion that the new variant targets a different patient group. So the people who are most at risk from the new variant are the same as the people most at risk from the previous or the wild type variant, as we would call it. Uh, so there's no reason to change the order in the priority groups just because the new variant is circulating. Thank you very much indeed. This concludes our questions from the media. And what I'd like to do now is offer my colleagues the chance to add any comments that you would like to. So, Munir, any further points you'd like to make? Thank you very much. Um, yes, a few closing remarks. Um, the World Health Organization has shown that vaccines save between two to three million lives each year. Um, so they are amongst the most effective public health interventions we have. We now have two COVID vaccines authorized in the UK and more on the way. Um, these will also save lives and provide us with the additional weapons we need in the fight against uh, COVID-19. I think with the authorization of vaccines, everybody uh, said that we can now see the light at the end of the tunnel. I completely agree with that. However, we're not there yet. While we hurtle towards that light, it is really important that everybody continues to follow government guidelines according to the tier you're in to reduce transmission of this virus. This is a new disease, only 12 months old, um, but these vaccines are also new and we need to learn much more about the vaccines in terms of their long-term effectiveness and in terms of their long-term safety. Fortunately, the UK has uh, some of the most uh, robust uh, and best surveillance mechanisms uh, in the world um, to allow us to be able to assess the long-term efficacy and the long-term safety uh, of these vaccines. Uh, which is going to be critical uh, to combating the pandemic. Let me finish by thanking all the people who willingly participated in the clinical trials to help combat the virus. We wouldn't be uh, here uh, at this point without uh, them volunteering to take part in the trials. I also want to thank the fantastic work carried out by scientists in developing the vaccines. The progress has been truly remarkable given that this disease is barely 12 months old. Thank you. Thank you, Munir. And Wei Shen, any remarks that you'd like to make? Thank you, June. Uh, I'd like to reassure everyone that the JCVI will continue to review all the latest information that comes out regarding both candidate vaccines and the existing vaccines as they are deployed. In addition, we will also be reviewing data relating to vaccine uptake um, because it's important to understand who is getting the vaccine and whether the right groups are getting the vaccine as the program is rolled out. Thank you. 
I would simply like to say that with this approval of the second vaccine, we are another step closer in helping to defeat this virus. We're getting there, but as Munir has said and Wei Xin has said, no one should drop their guard at this point, and we need to follow the restrictions and the advice, hands, face, space. But we are fighting back now, and this is another blow to this virus. From the MHRA's point of view, our clear message is that you can have every confidence in the safety, in the effectiveness, and in the quality of COVID-19 vaccine AstraZeneca. We are doing all we can to help protect the public. Our mission is to help protect the public and to save lives. And on that, everyone can be completely sure. This now brings the briefing session to a close. Thank you very much indeed.